Good evening. If we can get ready for tonight's service, just a reminder if you have a cell phone, if you could turn it off or we'll put it on silent so it doesn't disturb tonight's message. And if we could bow for a word of prayer. The Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for another night where we can gather together here with your people around your word in peace and safety, Lord. We thank you, Father, for all you've given us. We thank you for sending your Son, Lord, to die on the cross so that we could have a healed relationship with you through faith in him. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us and all the blessings that go along with salvation, Lord. We pray, Father, for pastors as he brings forth your word. We pray, Father, that our, open, our heart would be open to receive it, Lord, and that we can make your ways our ways, Lord, as we understand you and grow in your grace. Pray, Father, you would bless all that we do tonight. We lift up our sister Roseanne to you, Father, who's suffered an ankle injury, Lord. I pray you would heal her, Father, and bring her back. Just make her whole, Father, and just touch her heart, Lord, give her peace. And we thank you for all you've given us and entrusted us with, Lord. Pray you just give us the strength to continue to serve you and to persevere, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If we could stand and praise the Lord. Thanks. 
all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what Tonight's announcements, pastor's prayer and praise group will be meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. All are welcome to attend, as well as those you know who may be in need of prayer. This Friday will be the men's ministry at 6.30 p.m. Men, come on out. 
We'll be having a cookout right here, and uh, it'll be a good time. So men's ministry is starting up again this Friday at 6.30. Also, keep in prayer our sister Roseanne for the healing of her foot. And our brother Kevin Van Meter, who's not feeling well, if you can keep them in prayer. With that said, children and teachers can be dismissed to class. And now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our pastor tonight, Pastor John Ritchie. Amen. Good to be here. Um, I'd like you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn me to Romans chapter 11. Turn to Romans 11. I want you to look. We're going to be looking at verse 6 in a moment. It's going to have a word of prayer. Once we get to Romans 11, <clears throat> could we bow our heads and we'll go before the Lord. Father, tonight we're so grateful and so thankful to have another opportunity and privilege to be able to gather together with the people of God around the Word of God into the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, tonight I pray that as we go to your Word, you challenge our hearts. Give each one of us what we need. Help us to grow, to develop the spiritual discernment that we need in these last days of apostasy. And Father, I pray tonight that I might speak your word with wisdom and grace, conviction, passion, with the authority that your word deserves, and I pray that I might take the knowledge you've given me on this subject and make it clear and accurate and understandable, that your people may be blessed. And if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that's not saved, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin, of their need of Jesus Christ, that they might believe upon him and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his name. And I ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Tonight we're going to continue under the study of the conflict of the ages looking at Satan's attack on the gospel of grace. Hopefully tie this part of our study together tonight. This is an important, very important subject because the gospel of the grace of God is under attack today and it's not under attack in the world. The world has always rejected the gospel of grace for religion. It is attacked right within the Christian church, the professing Bible-believing churches today are preaching another gospel, subtly adding works to faith alone in Christ alone. And it's deceiving many and it's causing apostasy. It is another gospel, it is doctrine of demons, a doctrine of devils, and it is a deception that is leading many astray. Let's put our first principle up on the board tonight. Satan blinds the unbeliever to the message of the gospel of the grace of God and replaces the gospel of grace with religious work salvation. Religion is Satan's ace trump. Satan loves religion. Our next point. What is the definition of religion? Is man by his own morality, works of self-righteousness and merit, trying to earn an eternal relationship with God. It is man by his own righteousness trying to make himself acceptable to God. And the scripture says the only thing that God can accept is his own righteousness. The gospel is the power of God because it's a demonstration of his righteousness or a declaration of his righteousness according to Romans 1.17. And that means the righteousness that he provided through the cross, cross of Jesus Christ to all who believe. Satan offers mankind a counterfeit gospel, a gospel of faith plus works in the place of the gospel of the grace of God. And Satan uses false teachers. Our next principle, we must understand this. 
Satan uses false teachers to promote his policy of work salvation of religion. The Bible is very clear that for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Very clear that salvation is a gift. It's by grace, unmerited favor made possible because Christ satisfied the demands of God's righteousness on the cross. It is received through simple faith, believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God who rose again and who guarantees eternal life to all who believe. But Satan is using false teachers within Christendom, within the church today, to deny this. Listen to this. Is a, there's a famous preacher. You may or may have not heard of him, depending on how much you get around in Christian circles, by the name of John Piper. He's a, a Calvinist. He believes that Christ only died for the elect. He does not believe Christ died for all men, and he believes that it's not God's will to save all men, only a certain chosen predestined number. He also teaches that we're justified by faith, but our final salvation depends upon our works. So basically he's teaching Roman Catholicism. He's teaching that we get declared righteous and acceptable to God by that act of faith, and that gets us in a position with God whereby now our works will determine our final salvation. And this is pure heresy, it's Roman Catholicism, and yet millions of people are following after him, reading his books, keeping up with his you know, Twitter account and his uh, you know, conferences that are held all across the country and the world. Listen to what he said in, in one of his books called Future Grace. These works of faith are necessary for our final salvation. Works of faith are necessary for the final salvation. If you have no holiness, there will be no heaven. So we should not speak of getting to heaven by faith alone in the same way we are justified by faith alone. You see, he believes, and he's, he's done a little bit of a sleight of hand, play with words. He's, he likes to use flowery language, subtle nuances, act like he's come with some type of new breakthrough or recovered something that was lost to the church. And he's also a very dramatic, passionate speaker with a charismatic personality. But the problem is he doesn't speak truth. And he's, he's basically saying we're justified by faith, but we're saved finally in the end by our works. This is Roman Catholicism. Uh, he says, in this sense, love and obedience is required of believers, but not for justification, but it is required for entering into heaven. You see, that's how he pulls the sleight of hand. He'll give you the fact that you're justified by faith alone, but he won't let you get into heaven unless you what? Obey and serve and commit. You see, because what he's going to do is redefine faith and say, if you really have faith, faith means what? Sacrifice, service, obedience, and commitment. No, it does not. Faith means simply to believe the propositions that the scripture sets forth concerning Jesus Christ. Faith in anything is simply believing a proposition. Do you believe that Donald Trump is the president of the United States? If you say, I believe it, you have exhibited faith, okay? That's faith, it's belief. Do you believe George Washington was the first president of the United States? Yes, I believe it. That is faith, okay? It's simply belief, but that won't save you. That kind of faith won't save you. It is the object of faith that counts. If you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who rose again from the dead, and I believe his promise that he told me he'd save me if I believed in him, and you believe that, then you are saved. By believing the promise of Christ, who is the Son of God, who rose again from the dead. Faith is not obedience, it is not sacrifice, it is not commitment, it is what? Belief, period. Piper is confused. He's mixed salvation with sanctification. We're saved by grace through faith. We grow by what? Serving and learning and applying the word of God, sacrificing and praying 
and continuing and persevering in the faith. You see? But that's how we grow. That has nothing to do with final salvation, getting into heaven. That's our sanctification. This idea of having to do works to finally be saved is nothing more than Roman Catholicism. It's another gospel. It's a doctrine of devils. It is pure confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Piper is under demon influence. Big name, popular. I didn't say demon possessed. I said demon influence. He is promoting the doctrine of devils. He's promoting that you must do works of obedience and sacrifice to finally be saved. And he fools everybody by saying, oh yeah, you're justified by faith. But all that does is get you what? Started. From there, you've got to work the rest of the way. That's Catholicism. And he's leading thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, who buy his books and follow him astray. Interesting, isn't it? Very, very, very interesting. John MacArthur, another popular radio preacher, sells many, many books, popular speaker at conferences, has written this. Listen to what he's written. Submission to the will of God, to Christ's Lordship, is an essential, not an optional part of saving faith. So he says, it's not enough to believe in Jesus, you must submit to his Lordship. And here's, and here's how he defines that. When presenting the gospel, you are calling on someone to turn from their sin and follow Christ. Did you get that? You're saved by not just believing, but turning away from your sins and then what? Following Christ. No. Turning away from your sin and following Christ is part of your discipleship. It's part of your sanctification. It's part of your spiritual growth. But it has nothing to do with your final salvation from hell and condemnation. That is by faith alone. Works have a place in the Christian life, but not getting into heaven. They have a place of what? Being a part of our spiritual growth and our sanctification and will be rewarded by the Lord but they have nothing to do with getting into what? Heaven. This man is a very popular preacher. Listen to what else he said. Salvation comes from a life lived in obedience and service to Christ. <laughs> Salvation comes from a life of obedience and service. That's not what the Bible says. Sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Jesus said, He that believeth on me hath right now, presently, everlasting life. This is nothing more than deception. They're redefining faith. They'll say, we believe in faith alone, but the faith that saves works. It produces works. That's not the Bible. He says, the life we live determines our eternal destiny. No, the life we live does not determine our eternal destiny. Whether we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior or not determines our eternal destiny. He that believeth on the Son of God is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The life we live determines our eternal significance. We talked about that Sunday. We're going to talk about it this week. The life we live will determine our reward and our place and privilege in God's kingdom. But entering into the kingdom is an absolute free gift of God's grace given to everyone who simply what? Believes. Then those who what? Sacrifice and serve and work will be rewarded accordingly. And it will give eternal meaning, purpose and significance to their lives. Is everybody with me so far? And yet this is what is becoming popular in Christianity today. The scriptures, the scriptures are very clear. Romans 4, 5 tells us, To him that worketh not, but believeth upon him that, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. What well, could be simpler? Him that worketh not, but believeth on him. His faith is counted as righteousness. Romans 4, 5. Listen, the old hymn writer said, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I will not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean 
on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Augustic's top laddie wrote, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. The hymn writer wrote, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. I come empty-handed with nothing, pleading one thing, Jesus' shed blood and his promise to save all who believe. What a wonderful gospel. It's being lost today, folks. It's being lost today. I'll share an email Sunday that I received from a woman in Australia who found our website. And... Uh, she has a small little group of people meeting together and they're watching our live stream and our YouTube and uh, I guess the other videos that we present over in Australia. And she said that the country has been blessed, there's great prosperity and the prosperity gospel is dominating and she cannot find a grace gospel church. So she's meeting with a little group of believers. and. Uh, she says it's very hard when you decide to follow the truth of God's grace because today there's so many that have what? Bought into Satan's deceptions and his blinding people to the truth of the gospel. And the devil is using big name preachers. John MacArthur is renowned and respected in Christianity. All over the radio, book sales, bookstores, conference speak. John Piper, the same thing. He's gotten into the pulpits to what? To confuse people today. He's gotten into the pulpits to confuse people. Now, one thing we want to know, very important folks, and I want you to turn to Revelation 3. I want to show you something. Revelation 3, look at verse number 7 to 10, if you will. Revelation 3, 7 to 10. We have to have the spiritual discernment to understand that very importantly we have to have the spiritual discernment to understand that just because someone has a big name or a big ministry or is on television or sells a lot of books does not mean that they have what? Truth. It takes spiritual discernment, correct? And what you're going to find, and, and, I, and I don't know how many of you are, are at the place in your spiritual growth where you understand this, because one of the hardest things for people to do is to get their mind and their, off of what they see and off of the flesh and on what? Is that what I think I smell it is? Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. I smell a skunk, right? All right. But here's the... Here, let's, let's focus. Let's, let's keep concentrating. Listen. But here's the thing. People think, you know, big name, big church, a lot of book sales, popular. Must be what? Right. Must be truth, right? And maybe at one time these preachers taught good stuff. But now they have apostatized. I've just read to you what MacArthur and Piper believe. And there's literally thousands of preachers who revere them and follow them. And just regurgitate everything they say to their congregations. Okay? I want to tell you something right now. And I'll probably repeat this on Sundays, one of these Sundays coming up as we do this study on eternal significance. As the days get worse and the apostasy gets greater, the apostate churches are going to grow greater in number. Remember Laodicea in Revelation? Rich, wealthy, powerful, popular, thousands of what? Members, and yet the Lord said, you're poor, you're wretched, and you're blind. And he was on the outside knocking on the door, asking them to let him in. The big churches with the big names and the money and the popularity in the big crowds, right? In the last days, as the apostasy gets worse, you're going to realize something. We are in a very unique position. 
We're not, main, we're not a mega church. We may never be a, a huge congregation. We'll grow, but it'll be slow, steady growth because most people do not want to come to church today in this generation and do what you're doing right now. You have to love Jesus and love his word and really want to grow and get to know him to sit through an hour of Bible teaching and not just be entertained. You understand? But if you look at the book of Revelation, there were two churches that received no rebuke. Out of the seven churches, only two churches received no rebuke. And it wasn't the ones that were big and popular and prominent and wealthy. It was the two poorest churches that suffered the most, that received the praise from Jesus, and he didn't have one bad thing to say about them. Revelation chapter 3, look at verse 7. The church of Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. In other words, I'm going to make a way for you to proclaim my word. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. They weren't very prominent or wealthy or powerful. And hast kept my word. You see, they had a little strength. It was a small congregation. They weren't wealthy. They didn't have a lot. But they kept his what? Word. And he promises, look, I'm going to put an open door before you. You've not denied my name. And behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And the synagogue of Satan is a reference in the Bible to works-based religion. The Jews taught you're saved by keeping the law of Moses and being circumcised if you're a male. That is the synagogue of Satan. It is religious tradition and what? Works-based religion. And this is what is happening in the former Bible-believing churches today. They're apostatizing now. And you're going to see the smaller churches that dot the countryside here and there and around the world that are faithful, these are the places that will be proclaiming truth that the Lord will what? Honor in these last days. We'll go over to Revelation chapter 2. I want to show you something else. And here's another thing that's going to happen to the churches. There will be suffering, a price to pay at some point. We don't see it yet, but the day will come. Revelation chapter 2, if you will, look at verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which is dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation. I know, you got, I know you're doing the right thing. You're serving me. You're faithful. You're going through a lot of trouble. And poverty. I know you're not very wealthy. You're not very prominent. You're not very wealthy. But thou art rich. How are they rich? Spiritually. Spiritually rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Again, being opposed by what? Works-based religion and religious tradition. And then he says in verse number 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Small church, didn't have much wealth, didn't have much prominence, wasn't very popular, but they were rich spiritually because they were what? Faithful to the Word of God. And they were opposed by the synagogue of Satan. And what is the synagogue of Satan? Works-based religion that adds to faith alone and Christ alone and adds the traditions of men to the grace of God. Folks, we're going to need some serious spiritual discernment in the days ahead. The truth we see in the Revelation was not in the big prominent churches. 
The truth was in the little churches that didn't have much prominence and wealth but remained faithful to proclaim the truth of God's word and did not deny his name. And today many are denying the word of God and compromising it, scratching itching ears and denying his name to get a what? A big crowd to get numbers. And they're resorting to all kinds of gimmicks and games and entertainment to get a crowd rather than to what? Proclaim the word of God faithfully. Because when you proclaim the word of God faithfully, you're going to step on some toes. People aren't going to flock to you. They're going to get convicted. And they're not going to throw money at you because they're not happy with you <laughs> because they are convicted. But Paul said, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not to please men, but God who tries our heart. Our job is to please who? God. Not to please people. And those whose hearts are seeking truth, God will bring them in. God will bring them in if they're seeking truth. Okay, let's continue in our study tonight. And let's continue to look at the attack upon the gospel. Our, our next principle, if we could put it up. Salvation by grace and salvation by religious works are mutually exclusive. The only thing compatible with grace is faith because faith is non meritorious. Romans 11 6. If you want to read it with me, it says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise, grace is no more grace. So we see that if salvation is by grace, then it has nothing to do with what? Works. If you add one work to the plan of salvation, you have nullified what? Grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see, they're mutually exclusive. You're either saved by grace or you're saved by works. You're not saved by grace plus works. That would nullify grace. Once you add one work, it's no longer grace. Romans 4.16 tells us very simply that if you'll turn to Romans chapter 4 and verse number 16, it says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by what? Grace. The only thing compatible with grace is faith. You see, that's why salvation must, if salvation is by grace, then it must be by faith, and it must be by faith alone. You see, the only thing that is compatible with grace is faith, because great faith is non-meritorious. There's no merit in faith. It's not a work. It's the antithesis of work. It's the opposites of work. All faith is is simply the inward conviction that something is true. Faith is simply believing a proposition. Saving faith is believing the biblical proposition about Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God who rose again and guarantees eternal life to all who believe in him. And that's all it is. Nothing more, but certainly nothing less than that. Okay? And it is head faith. The Bible knows nothing about a difference between, oh, they got head faith, you need hot faith. No. There's nothing. Head faith is hot faith. Hot faith is head faith. As a man believeth in his what? Heart. His what? Head. And here's the key. The only distinction the Bible knows is not between head faith and hot faith. Not between genuine faith and not genuine faith. The Bible knows only one distinction between belief and unbelief. That's what the distinction the Bible makes. That's as simple as it is. Okay, now we move forward. We know that God's judgment is upon this false gospel. It's another gospel. We also noted last week that Satan uses religious mysticism to deceive the unbelieving world. Uh, we'll put that principle up on the board. Satan uses religious mysticism to deceive the unbelieving world. Satan uses false miracles, apparitions, false prophets who claim visions and supernatural healings as an example of mysticism of religion. In other words, people think just because 
something is supernatural, it must be of God. I mentioned last week, oh, the Catholic Church will tell you, Mary's appearing in Medjugorje. Oh, people got you know, their legs healed. Uh, people felt something. People saw something. Maybe they did. But let me tell you something. That ain't of God. Because the Bible says Jesus is the only way to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, how do you know if a miracle is of God or if a miracle is of Satan? Well, we read last week in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that when Antichrist comes, he's going to come with what? Miracles, all deceivableness, deceivableness, deception, and lying signs and what? Wonders. Satan is going to come on the scene with the religious false prophet who's going to promote him. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene. Satan's going to promote him. With what? How's he going to gain power and popularity and prominence? Through miracles, through supernatural signs and wonders. Is, he, is the Antichrist of God? No, but he's doing supernatural signs and wonders. How do you know if it's of God or not? What are the doctrines they're teaching? Specifically, what are they saying about Jesus Christ? Who is he? And what do they say about salvation, how you are saved? If someone is teaching that you need to take sacraments and do penance and confess your sins to a priest and eat a wafer to be saved and probably have to stop in purgatory for a while before you're saved and then tell you Mary's appearing and doing miracles, this is of God, if you have spiritual discernment, what should you say? Reject it. It's of what? Satan. It's, it's lying signs and wonders. And this is why we've got to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Satan, now let's put our next principle up on the board. If we can, Mike, our next principle. Satan has his ministers preaching another Jesus and counterfeit Christs that cannot save. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4. If you will look there. The Bible's very clear that there's another Jesus that cannot save. You say what? Well, there's only one Jesus, right? The Jesus of the Bible is the eternal Son of God, co-eternal with the Father, right? Consubstantial with the Father and the Spirit, meaning of the same substance. He's the second person of the Trinity. He always was, he always will be. He became incarnate and took upon human flesh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross and rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven and he's coming back to judge his enemies and establish his kingdom one day. That's the Jesus of the Bible, right? That's the Jesus that saves, God incarnate, true humanity, undiminished deity in one person. Okay. But in Paul's day, they were beginning to preach what was another Jesus. Now was it really another Jesus? No, it was a false Jesus. It was a counterfeit Christ. Okay? And the Gnostics, you know, had all their different various beliefs, depending on the group of Gnostics you were with, about who Jesus was, okay? Um, he was just a, a man who the Christ Spirit came upon. He never rose physically from the dead, etc., etc., etc. They had all different viewpoints. And this was what Paul called another Jesus, because that Jesus cannot save. The only Jesus can, who can save is the Jesus who is the eternal Son of God, who is the second person of the Trinity, who came into what? This world, took upon human flesh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose again, and ascended back into heaven, and is coming again. That Jesus can save. Now look what it says in verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, there you go, there's another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Which Jesus did Paul preach? The one I just mentioned. The one who is the eternal Son of God who came into the world and died on the cross and was buried and rose again and ascended into heaven. Or if he receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel 
which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So there's another Jesus. Uh, there's also counterfeit Christs. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, if you will. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. And Jesus warned us of this, and he said in verse 24 of Matthew 24, he said, For there shall rise false Christs and false prophets, Matthew 24, 24, and shall show great signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's the, the, the church. So, Satan uses false Christs and another Jesus. Okay, let's make it more practical. Say, Pastor, can you give me an example today of another Jesus and another gospel? Sure. Well, first of all, we've already looked at another gospel. Lordship salvation. That which Piper and MacArthur and Chan and Comfort and Paul Washer and all these other guys that are becoming popular preachers are preaching. It's nothing more than a work salvation. That's another gospel. The Catholic Church preaches what? Another gospel, right? Anyone who teaches that you can lose salvation, the Pentecostals and the, and the Methodists and the Nazarenes and the Churches of Christ, they, they're teaching another gospel. Those who are teaching you have to be baptized to be saved, they're preaching another gospel, okay? But what about another Jesus? Well, you ever heard of the Jehovah Witnesses? The Jehovah Witnesses have a Jesus, and they actually call him the Son of God. But they don't, see, that you've got to understand, a lot of times it just plays on words. It's a matter of, it's a game of semantics. The Jehovah Witnesses say they believe in Jesus, but ask them who Jesus is. He is a created being. He is not the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, consubstantial of the same substance with the Father and the Spirit. Okay? He's a created being. They say he's Michael the archangel. And their plan of salvation is you believe in Jesus and you have to what? Do works and hold out till the end in order to be saved. That's another Jesus and that's another what? Gospel. And you'll note that these cultic groups that have another Jesus always have another gospel. You'll never hear the gospel of grace from a group that denies who Jesus really is. Because if he's God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, who shed his blood on the cross, that's the blood of what? God. Right? That's perfect. That's one drop of that blood is enough to wash away the sins of what? The world. It's the perfect sacrifice. And it doesn't need any help. God doesn't need any help when he sheds his blood for sin. He saves by grace. He doesn't say, uh, believe in the blood and keep working, and you'll get to heaven. No. Believe in the blood, it's a what? Enough. It is enough. Okay? But every false cultic group that has another Jesus that denies that Jesus is God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, they always have what? Another gospel. You say, what about the Roman Catholics? They don't deny that. Well, if you really study, they'll, they give lip service to the Trinity, but they also teach this doctrine called the eternal generation of the Son, which is nonsense. They say the Son was eternally generated. How can that happen? You can't be eternally generated. It means somehow he was eternally born. You're either born or you're not. Okay? And then what they really do is if they believe the Trinity, then they take Mary and they elevate Mary above who? Jesus as a co-mediator in salvation. You need to pray to her to be what? Saved. You see? So here are the Mormons. They have another Jesus. They believe Jesus is just a little God. Lucifer's brother. And they believe any human being can become like Jesus and become a little God. Get your own planet, birth your own spiritual families. Did you ever hear of Muslims? The Muslims have a Jesus. They include him in there. But to them, you say, who is Jesus? He's just a prophet. 
a lesser prophet than who? Muhammad. He's not God in the flesh. The second person of the Trinity, eternal son of God. Um, the New Ages and the Hindus, they believe in a Christ. They say Jesus was a good man who tapped into the Christ consciousness and used it as a force for good. Just like you can use the force for what? Evil. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Buddhists believe pretty much the same thing as the Hindus. It's, I'm God, you're God, we're all God. Jesus was a good man. And he tapped into the Christ spirit and used it for good. You could do the same. You know, all this motivational crap that goes on today, all this empowerment speaking, all this motivational speaking, it's all new age. It's all that you have within you, the key to answer all the problems of life. Just tap into the power that's in you, because basically you are God. That's, that's Satan's old lie. Eat of the tree, and you shall be as who? God. It's a lie, it's a deception. The liberal Protestant churches have a Jesus, but who is he? Just a good human teacher. We're not saved by his blood, we're saved by what? Following his example. And that's why these liberal Protestant churches are always involved in what? Feeding the poor, helping, getting involved in social justice, protesting political injustice, etc. But they don't preach the blood because they have another Jesus. They have another Jesus. Now, let's put our next principle up on the board, if you will, Mike. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and grace is God's only plan of salvation. And we're going to read that again. Okay? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and grace is God's only plan of salvation. If you're going to be saved it's going to be by grace through faith in Jesus Christ not of works lest any man should boast grace is all that God is free to do for man because of the cross it's his unmerited favor freely given to all who what believe with no claim and no expectation in return grace means that God does everything we just accept it by faith, by believing. That's the plan of salvation the scripture sets forth. It can't be any other way because all our human righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy, what? Rags before him. That's what Isaiah says. Your, all our good works is filthy rags. It troubles me that Christians have swallowed the false teaching that's now infesting the seminaries and the churches, this lordship salvation stuff. And they're redefining faith. And what they are doing is preaching another Jesus and another gospel. And the anathema of God is upon it. Let's look at what the scripture says about salvation is only through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's only by God's grace. Grace is God's plan of salvation. Uh, look at Acts, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to look at a bunch of verses here. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. If you will. Neither is there salvation in any other. Now Peter was speaking about the name of Jesus. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only salvation in the name of who? Jesus, but not another Jesus, the Jesus of what? The Bible. The Jesus who is God incarnate, who lived the sinless life, died for our sins, rose again and ascended up in heaven and is coming again. There's only salvation in the name. There's no salvation in Buddha or Muhammad or anyone what else. Uh, look at John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse number 6. It, Jesus said, Unto them I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by what? Me. 
The only way to God is through who? Jesus. When he says, I am the way, the word way in Greek of the New Testament, hodos, it means a path, a road. All roads do not lead to heaven. All religions do not lead to heaven. There's only one road to heaven, Jesus. But it's the Jesus of what? The Bible. Not another Jesus. Not a counterfeit Jesus. Uh, if you will, John chapter 6, verse 47. Jesus says, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 6 47 Jesus says verily verily I say unto you he that believeth on me hath everlasting life people say what does it mean to believe on Jesus to believe on Jesus is to believe the propositions that the Bible sets forth about Jesus you know there's a lot of this talk and we've probably been guilty of this too you know it's a personal relationship well Salvation is not a personal relationship. Salvation is not a relationship. Salvation is an act of faith in Jesus Christ. After that comes the what? Relationship. Okay? But, and so we, gotta get, we really shouldn't use that language anymore. Okay? Because it's really not correct. Because when you say it's a personal relationship, you make people think there's some type of feeling and emotion that's got to be involved, and you've got to sense something and feel something. And listen, when you got saved, you might have felt something. I felt great. I know people who wept. I know people who got chills up and down their spine. I know people who had all kinds of experiences, okay, who were just happy for days, okay? But that's not the salvation, okay? Salvation comes through an act of faith sir what must I do to be saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved believe the proposition about who Jesus is what's the biblical proposition he's the son of God who died for your sins rose again and he promises to save you if you believe in him that's all now after that do you develop this relationship with him sure you do but you're not saved by a personal relationship. You're saved by believing. And then people may say, well, you're kind of, aren't you kind of straining on that? No, just trying to be accurate. I've been guilty of using that phrase, but it's not biblical. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says, oh, you've got to have a personal relationship. No. When the Bible talks about salvation, it says over a hundred times, Believe, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth into a personal relationship with me hath everlasting life. He doesn't say that. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, once we believe on him, then what do we do? We work on the what? The relationship. Right? I've been working on my relationship with the Lord ever since the day that I believed in him. But I didn't get saved by having a personal relationship. Having a personal relationship was the result of me getting saved. So let's be clear and let's not confuse people with this. Okay? Salvation is by believing. Uh, go, if you will, to Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Let's be accurate, folks. Let's be biblical. Look what it says. Knowing that a man is not justified, and to be justified means to be declared righteous, by the works of the law. It's not by works. But by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. You say, what's the faith of Christ? It means the faithfulness of Christ. We believe in him, he's faithful to justify us. That's what it's saying. When it talks about the faith of Christ, it means the faithfulness of Christ. It says, if we, even we have believed in Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. What's that mean? Once you believe in Jesus, he's faithful to declare you what? Righteous and save you. That's what it means. And not by works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be what? Justified. Go with me to John's Gospel, chapter 8, 24. And 
we got about six or seven minutes, and we'll tie this together. John's Gospel, chapter 8, and we're going to look at verse number 24. Look what Jesus says here. He's speaking to the Pharisees. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your what? Sins. He says, if you don't believe that I am he, that I am God incarnate, that I am the I am of the Old, Test Old Testament, when, when, when the Lord appeared to Moses and Moses said, who are you? Who should I tell him sent me? What did, what did God say? Tell him what? I am sent you. Jesus told them, I am. That's why they wanted to kill him. Because they said, thou being a man, makest thyself out to be what? God. And that's exactly what he was claiming, and the Jews knew it. A lot of people today don't know who Jesus really was. The Jews who listened to him and saw him face to face knew exactly who he was claiming to be. That's why they wanted to kill him. He said, you being man, they're trying to be equal with who? God. And they wanted to stone him to death because they said, that's blasphemy. Now, folks, turn with me, if you will, I want to give you one more verse. Over in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and then I want to give you some points and we'll be out of here for tonight. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Look what it says. God's, there's only salvation in Jesus' name and God's plan of salvation is only grace. There's only one plan of salvation, it's grace. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Notice, it was not by any works that we did that he saved us. You see? Bible, over and over and over again, it's so clear, as clear as the nose on your face. But today, modern so-called Bible teachers and preachers are redefining faith. And they're making faith and this is the trick. If you were to ask men like MacArthur and Piper and this, the guys that follow them, are we saved by faith alone? They'd say, sure. But the problem is they redefine what faith is, you see? Faith in the Bible is simply belief. Belief in the biblical propositions concerning Jesus Christ. They say faith is commitment, submission to lordship, obedience, loyalty, perseverance, sacrifice. They say faith works. No, faith does not work. In fact, the Bible says faith is the antithesis of works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Faith is set up as the exact opposite of what works. Faith does not work. Okay? Faith believes propositions. Faith accepts as true propositions, okay? But these, they're teaching today that faith is sorrow for your sin. Faith includes forsaking your sins. Faith includes obedience and loyalty and surrender and holiness. And here's the problem with all that. They've taken the doctrine of sanctification that says once you are saved, you need to grow need to learn his word, apply it to your life, and do works of service so he can reward you, etc. But that has nothing to do with getting into heaven. That has to do with your reward, like we're talking about on Sundays. And they have now confused justification, salvation, with sanctification. They've blended them together. Okay? And they've redefined what faith is. And they've made faith into something more than simple belief and we've got to be clear on this why because if we are not saved by faith then no man or woman 
boy or girl, can ever know for sure that they're saved. And that's why so many people that listen to MacArthur and Piper in these churches struggle with the assurance of salvation, knowing that right now, this minute, I am saved and will be saved forever. Because if our salvation depends upon our service, our holiness, our obedience, our surrender, our submission, our sacrifice, we will never know if we've done it long enough or well enough or good enough to be saved. And we will not be looking by faith to Jesus and his cross and his promise to have the assurance that I'm going to be in heaven. We're going to be looking inwardly at our what? Selves to see if I've done enough. And what we really have now is faith in our own what? Works, in our own self. And we're, going to, we're never going to be able to have an assurance with God that we're saved. But if we simply take God at his word, God cannot lie, and he promises. If you believe in my son, the Lord Jesus, that he's the son of God who rose again and gives eternal life to all who trust him, all who believe him, you will be saved. Nothing more, but certainly nothing less than that. And if we believe that, and rest in that, we can have assurance because we're looking at the perfect work of the Son of God on the cross. The perfect work that can never what, change, that'll never lose its power. We're not trusting self, we're trusting what Jesus did for us. You see? Let me clarify these two points and we'll close. I promise you. I want to give you a definition of faith. And get it down. Don't miss this. And, and, and from now on, I would challenge you, when you're talking with people, don't bring out any other issues. You know, you should never tell people that salvation is turning from your sins and forsaking your sins or feeling sorry for sins. You, you may say to a person that, you know, you have to acknowledge that you are a sinner to be saved. Sure, that's okay. Sure. And nobody's going to get saved unless they realize they need to be saved, right? That's nothing wrong with that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But when you're talking to people, you want to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes. He that believeth on the Son of God is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. And this is the definition of faith from the, from the biblical standpoint. Faith is the inward conviction that something is true. Faith requires thought and belief, knowledge and assent. Faith is simply the belief of propositions. What's a proposition? I'll give you a biblical proposition. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a biblical proposition. Right? That gives his knowledge there. Now, if I assent to that and I say, yes, I believe that, that's assent. That's faith. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. That's a biblical proposition. There's some knowledge there, right? There's thought. If I assent to it, now I what? Believe it. You see? Jesus Christ promised me if I believe in him he would save me and I would have eternal life I either what assent to it or I don't I either inwardly believe it or I what don't you see that's saving faith let's read it again faith is the inward conviction that something is true faith requires thought and belief knowledge and assent faith is simply the belief of propositions you know like I said to you before you believe Abraham Lincoln was the president during the Civil War? You either say what? I believe it or I what? I don't. There's a proposition. Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War. Now you, you either believe it or you what? You don't. The proposition is he's the president during the Civil War. If you were sent to it and say, yes, I do believe it, you've exhibited faith in a proposition. However, Abraham Lincoln being president won't save you. But if you take that same faith, and put it in the proposition that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sins and rose again and guarantees to give you eternal life if you believe, that will save you. 
the, the, what makes saving faith different than just regular faith? The object. Thanks, Stevie. Good. Awesome. The object of the faith. And you say, well, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? It means to believe that the propositions that the Bible says about him, the words that the Bible says about Jesus are what? True. That he's the son of God who died for our sins, rose again, and promises to save everyone who believes. That's as simple as it is. I'll give you one more point, which clarifies things. The next point, Mike, our last one, we close. We covered a lot of ground tonight. This was good. We'll be able to pick up at another point. Next week, we're going to look at how Satan uses secular humanism to deceive the world. We'll look at that. It's going to be a good study. So saving faith is believing that the propositions about Jesus Christ that we find in the Bible are true. It's belief that he is the Son of God who rose from the dead and guarantees eternal life to all who believe. To believe the biblical propositions is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. People say, what does it mean to believe in Christ or believe on Christ? It simply means to believe that what the Bible says about him is what? True. It's to believe it. Right? It's to believe the proposition. And this has somehow been lost today. Because everybody's all about, you got to feel something, you got to do something, you got to see something. And that's not biblical. We have to be clear about what faith is and not be confused about it. Especially when you go out to what? Share the gospel with people. To be clear that to be saved what you must do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who rose again, who guarantees eternal life to you. Now here's one thing I want you to note about that, and I'll just add this in as I end. There are plenty of people that you will tell, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And they'll say, I believe it. And they do. And you will say, do you believe that he rose again from the dead? And they say, I believe it, and they do, and yet they're not saved. You know why? Be they're still going and getting a wafer from a priest. They're still doing penance. They still think their baptism is going to get them into heaven. They still think helping the poor is going to get them in. Why? Because they don't believe the third point that I mentioned. He's the Son of God who rose again, who promises and guarantees eternal life to everyone who what? believes in him. You see, when you're believing in Christ, you're believing that he's the Son of God who rose again, who guarantees eternal life to everyone who believes in him. You say to a Roman Catholic, you believe in Jesus, the Son of God? Yes. You believe he rose again from the dead? Yes. You're going to, why are you going to go to heaven? I'm a good person. I get my sacraments. You're going to split hell wide open. You have to believe in him as the one who guarantees and promises what? Eternal life. And we've got to be clear about that. Ah, ah, you have to tell people, are you believing in him for eternal life? Thank God you believe he's the son of God. Thank God you know he rose again. But do you believe in his promise to save you? And not put your faith in what? works or sacraments or baptism or anything church membership or anything else and that's the key okay we'll pick up with some more interesting studies on this subject of satan's attack on mankind and the church next week let's bow our heads for prayer Father, tonight we're so grateful and so thankful to have had this time to note and to study these things from your word. And I do pray that you challenge our hearts that we'll continue to grow, Lord. Help us, Father, to really discern your truth and to be clear and accurate, Lord, 
in rightly dividing the word and having the proper information, Lord, to give out. And Lord, I pray tonight, if there be anyone that is listening or will listen in the future that's not saved, my prayer is that you would convict them of their sin and their need of Jesus Christ, that they would believe upon him, believe upon him and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his name. And take a moment of silent prayer for anyone who wishes to trust Christ right now. Now, Father, tonight, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart and they have believed in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, my prayer is that you would give them assurance that you've forgiven them and saved them. Pray that you reveal your love to them in a special way, and I ask that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we depart tonight, I pray that you take the written word and make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Folks, it has been a pleasure. Have a great night. Don't forget, prayer meeting tomorrow night if you can make it, and Friday men's group will be having a, a cookout. Every, every guy is invited. <laughs>